I mean, I bought properties that are short term rentals today that I actually got for zero money down, right? And then now you capture that 30% bonus depreciation and use that to offset your active stream of income. Yes. That is a huge tax savings that a lot of people just don't allude to. Yeah. I mean, Rich, if you had $300,000 of W 2 income and you have a $300,000 rental loss on the tax return, you're virtually tax free. And this is what I'm trying to tell more W-2 taxpayers to do. Acquire a short-term rental, have your tenants stay in there on average seven days or less. You only need to get to a hundred hours. I mean, you're going to get to a hundred hours before the end of the year, setting up a short-term rental property. And now you get to benefit from, from some of the same tax laws that these big real estate investors get to benefit mm -hmm. from, which is depreciation. All right, guys, welcome to another episode of the reports. Today we are live in the studio here in downtown San Diego. We got a little rain outside and it's November. We got Thanksgiving coming up soon. I'm loving this, this fall time and uh, just overall vibe. But uh, I got a very special guest today who just drove down from Newport Beach, California. He helps 3,200 real estate investors and entrepreneurs save millions of dollars in taxes in both real estate and business. I got Carlton Dennis. Carlton, welcome to the show, my man. Rich, what's up, man? Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited yeah. to be on. Yeah, dude. Uh, super excited to have you on, man. I know uh, we've been talking on social media. A couple of the folks uh, that have been on this podcast, uh, Blake Rocha and Jack Jack McCall, he, they connected us and um, dude, I've heard a lot of great things about you. So super excited to finally connect, man. I've been looking forward to this, man. I'm ready to bless the audience. Yeah, man. So I'm, I guess first question is like, how the hell did you get into uh, like the real estate taxes and yeah. all this sort of stuff? Because it's, it's not like something that, you know, they teach in school. That's for sure. And yeah. So how did you like even get into this to begin with? Yeah. So I do not have a traditional background as a tax professional. I did not go to school for accounting. I had no intentions of being a enrolled agent or a CPA at all. I went to school for kinesiology. And the reason why I majored in kinesiology was because I had a full football scholarship. So I was like, okay, if I'm playing football and I want to go professional, I should probably learn about how the body moves. And that's what kinesiology is. What position did you play? I played corner. Corner. Yeah. Okay. I got to go against some, some yeah, pretty so, cool cats. So you got some some speed and a uh, good reaction time. Reaction time. Yeah. More reaction time than speed, but yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, what level did you play at? What was the highest level? Uh, college. Yeah. D1 college. What school? Cal Poly San Luis Obispo. Okay. You played it slow. Yeah, nice, man. man. I played it slow. That's that's big time right there. It's um, fun. Yeah. I love watching football. Um, yeah, I just... It's, it's such a quick sport. I mean, just the reaction time and just how quickly the speed of the game happens that. And then, and then NBA, I love basketball too. Yeah. I'm a big Lakers sport. fan. Laker sure. fan? Yeah. We got, we got basketball on and NFL on right now. Like yeah. I'm in heaven. <laughs> so, uh, what are your thoughts? Cause I'm a, I'm a Clipper fan. I grew up a Clipper fan. My whole family has been Laker fan growing up. So as a kid, I was like, um, I want to go against the grain, but also the Clippers, this is back in like the mid to late nineties. Yeah. They used to play half of their home games at the Anaheim pond. That's right. And, um, this is back in the day. So my brother-in-law had season tickets to when they played at the pond. And so he would take me to some of the games. Sick. And so since like 96, 97, I've always been a Clipper fan because of it. There was some tough years, but as soon as they got rid of Sterling, they started, you know, turning things around. Yeah. Um, and they've had a pretty decent squad. I would say the last like 12 years or so. I now, would say so. They just picked up Harden and I'm like, okay. Okay. Um, <laughs> we got we got we got four solid like Hall of Fame players that yeah. are not too old yet. We got Kawhi, PG, Westbrook, and Harden. I'm like, okay, like we're honestly, but they're like 0 and 5 with Harden. So, what are your thoughts there? Can they turn it around? They still need time to figure it out. It was kind of yeah. like when LeBron and AD got together, and we had a few other pieces, and we're like, okay, we're going to the championship. Mm -hmm. And then we did in that year. And then we went to the bubble and then finally won a championship, right? Yeah. So I think it's just spending time together and building rapport, but they have a solid squad. I will have to say, though, they are living in the shadow of the Lakers. I mean, they are the number one team in L.A. <laughs> yeah, right now. So. That, that is true. And um, I think until they get out of Staples Center, they're going to be under the shadow of the, Lake, the Lakers. Yeah. Um, but luckily, like, hey, Bomber, you know, he's got some deep pockets. Um, <sighs> Does he? Unlike, yeah. unlike the uh, San Diego Chargers ownership that took them up to L.A. because the owner couldn't, you know, fund his own stadium. Yep. Um, going to the taxpayers to try to get it funded didn't get done. They went up to L.A., but Bomber... <laughs> uh, is funding them their own arena. They're moving in, I believe, next season. It'll be ready. Yeah, yeah. In England, it's beautiful, bro. Yeah. yeah, I haven't seen it. They're showing some online, some photos. Really? Looks sick. Yeah, but a, a real owner should fund the, these arenas and stadiums. I not agree. The taxpayers. Why doesn't San Diego have a football team anymore, man? Now they're sharing the stadium with the Rams. Cheap, What's cheap, that all cheap about? Ownership, man. Cheap, man. Yeah. So we'll Gotta see. Got to turn that around. I, I think whoever goes and buys the San Diego Chargers one day, if that family ever sells, I don't think they will. But yeah. 
whoever buys the LA Chargers, brings them back to San Diego is going to be a hero. That needs to happen, man. There's too much legacy here in San Diego with football. It does. So anyways, man, I got so many questions to ask you about the real estate taxes and, and how people can save on taxes. It's such a, such a hot topic. Yeah. Um, but first, first things first, um, you know, I have a Wyoming LLC. And yeah. it's kind of my holding LLC. It's my parent LLC. And, and we have a lot of different holding LLCs within all the stuff that we're doing. Yep. Some of it's Delaware because some of the SEC attorneys that we work with happen to be out on the East Coast. And so they ended up just forming us Delaware uh, LLCs. And, and a lot of other attorneys form us Wyoming LLCs, right? Yep. Um, so, you know, obviously there's some advantages of having a LLC in a non-piercing state, yep. uh, Nevada, Delaware, and Wyoming. Talk a little bit about the benefits of why those states. Yeah, many entrepreneurs or many investors will set up LLCs in the state of Wyoming because Wyoming has both inside and outside liability protection. What I mean by that is when you set up an LLC, you're protected from the things that can go on inside your business. But what happens when you do something outside of your business? Like, God forbid, you drive over somebody's leg or, you know, your daughter falls off of a trampoline with the neighbor and she gets hurt and they sue you. If you're in a situation like that, you might have to liquidate the assets out of your LLC to satisfy the creditors or the lawsuit that you're going through, unless your LLC is in a charging order protection state, such as Wyoming or Delaware. What charging order means is that the lawyer will have to, the defending lawyer, will have to put a charging order on your LLC, which means that the only way that those creditors are going to get paid is if you decide to take a distribution from your LLC. And what that does is it gives you control. You get to determine whether or not you want to pull money out of your entity. You could even choose to take loans out of your entity now. Mm -hmm. So what this ends up doing is it forces a settlement when you're in a lawsuit situation. And that provides you with that outside liability protection that you could be looking for as an investor. I love that. So uh, for any of the the investors listening, if you want to structure your org chart, typically you want to have a holding LLC or a parent LLC. And you're saying it should be Delaware or Wyoming and not Nevada. Is that correct? It depends on what you're trying to do. I personally like Wyoming because Wyoming is where LLCs were created. LLCs were first brought to Alaska. Alaska said no. And then the state of Wyoming decided to accept LLCs. Once LLCs were formed in Wyoming, Wyoming opened up a court of chancery where they deal with all types of cases of real estate investors and business owners. So you have a higher likelihood of having things go in your favor during a lawsuit if your entity that's the parent company is established in a place like Wyoming versus another state that doesn't have a court of chancery plus an amenity. I don't want people to know my name is on my investment property mm-hmm. if they look up who owns this property. So Wyoming does not require managers' names to be listed online, allowing investors like you and I to fly under the radar. Yeah. Um, I know some of our legal counsel, they've advised us like if there was some sort of lawsuit, um, often, you know, they the person going after you will look up your stuff. And if they see Wyoming entity, they might just advise your client like, hey, it's not even worth the time or the effort because you're probably not going to win. And it just stops there. That's pretty powerful. Yeah. And one of the things I will say about that is most people sue somebody who they know. Right. So if you're if you're someone that's close to you in your circle, someone that's close to you in your circle or someone you physically can see who that person is. For example, let's just say that I was a disgruntled uh, tenant staying in your property. And then I went online and found out who owned this property. And I saw that the owner was Jack and Lisa Johnson. And I went on LinkedIn and found Jack and Lisa Johnson. Now I see a photo of Jack and Lisa Johnson. I know when they where they went to high school, when they graduated college, when they got their first careers. This starts to create animosity inside of the person and they might be more inclined to sue you Mm. because they know who you are now versus just seeing X, Y, and Z corporation held in Wyoming where there's no one's name and information online. And when they look up the address, the address is associated to some virtual address company. Now Mm. the likelihood of that person feeling confident that they can win a lawsuit goes down dramatically. Yeah, absolutely. That's that's good to know. So to take it a step further, um, above your holding or a parent LLC, and this is something that I still have yet to set up, but I, I plan to set it up. Uh, you can have a living trust. Correct. Um, Talk a little bit about what the benefits are of having a living trust. And would the living trust be above your your parent LLC? Yeah, so you would recategorize your Wyoming entity to be owned by your trust. And the reason why you would want a trust is because God forbid, if something were to happen to you, you would want all your assets to be passed off to your beneficiaries Mm. as opposed to going through the probate process. The probate process kind of sucks because it's six months for the banks to decide how to divvy up your assets but you owe taxes on whatever assets that you left behind for your heirs, children, family members, et cetera. 
The downside though to not having a trust and probably one of the biggest benefits to having a trust is step up in basis. You will not receive any step up in basis on your assets if they are not transferred into a trust upon the date of your death. So what that means to investors like you and I, if we bought a property for a million dollars and 10 years later it's worth 10 million, well, that's a $9 million gain that our children would have to pay taxes on if we passed away. Not if we had a trust, mm. they would be able to sell that asset at $10 million and pay no capital gains taxes. And that's how generational wealth is passed on is by using the right trust and corporate entity structures. I love that. What is the difference between a revocable trust and an irrevocable trust? Yeah, a revocable trust, I kind of look at it like you have the combination to the lock. You can open this up whenever you want, put stuff in it whenever you want and close it back up whenever you want. But a irrevocable trust you don't have the pen. As soon as you put assets into that irrevocable trust, you've given up complete ownership mm. of it. And so many taxpayers choose to set up revocable living trusts early on in entrepreneurship, early on in their wealth building. And once you get to that point where you know which assets you're going to actually keep and pass on to the next heirs, you will switch your revocable living trust to an irrevocable trust. Gotcha. And is the, the basis behind that is like, you know, you know, you're about, you're probably going to die with those same assets and then you don't want the next generation to be messing with them. Is that why? Yeah. And you can create rules inside of the revocable or the irrevocable gotcha. trust that determines when your children get uh, access to those assets, the voting rights along uh, the assets that you're leaving and how they're being dispersed. Gotcha. That makes a lot of sense. Um, so, you know, there's a lot of folks out there that have uh, high income, inc they're high income earners. Uh, whether it's W-2 or it's through their business, um, and they they don't qualify for professional real estate status. Yeah. Um, and there's a loophole out there that I like to call the STR loophole um, that, you know, a lot of folks don't know is out there. Yeah. Um, even a lot of CPAs, to my surprise, a lot of CPAs don't even know this exists. Yeah. My old CPA, before I, you know, really started getting heavy into the real estate investing, when I told her of this, she had no idea, and she's been a CPA for like 20 years with hundreds and hundreds of clients. Yep. And so um, anyways, this is a big play right now. Yep. Uh, explain a little bit about what the STR loophole is. Yeah, the short-term rental strategy is truly a loophole because in 1987, the IRS wrote into law that if you're managing an investment property, you can use real estate losses if you're spending 750 hours and you're spending more time in real estate than any other thing. But what this also did is it disqualified all these W-2 taxpayers who were originally buying investment properties and using depreciation to offset their W-2 taxes. Well, in that exact same law in 1987, the IRS defined what a short-term rental was. And they said, if you're running a property where your tenants are staying on average seven days or less, you don't have to abide by these real estate professional laws. You don't have to spend 750 hours. You don't have to show me that you're spending more time in real estate than any other thing. All you have to do is show me that you're materially participating. So the IRS has seven material participation tests. One of those seven tests is spending 100 hours and more than any other person, which comes out to about 30 minutes a week in a 365 day period, right? Mm -hmm. So if you're able to buy a short-term rental property, W-2 taxpayer, 1099 taxpayer, and manage that property for 100 hours, and more than anyone else, such as your cleaning lady or your repair person, you too can benefit from real estate losses. This allows many of my W-2 taxpayers to perform cost segregation studies, and now we can offset their W-2 income, and that money comes back to them in the form of a refund check when they file their tax returns. It's such a powerful thing. I mean, if, for example, if you buy a million dollars short-term rental um, and your average guest stay for the calendar year is seven nights or less, um, and you qualify for all those other triggers that you just alluded to, um, and you do a cost segregation study, you might get somewhere around 30% uh, depreciation. That's so correct. On a million dollar property, that's $300,000. And you probably put a fraction down on that property. I mean, I bought properties that are short term rentals today that I actually got for zero money down, right? And then now you capture that 30% bonus depreciation and use that to offset your active stream of income. Yes. That is a huge tax savings that a lot of people just don't allude to. Yeah. I mean, Rich, if you had $300,000 of W-2 income and you have a $300,000 rental loss on the tax return, you're virtually tax-free. 
And this is what I'm trying to tell more W-2 taxpayers to do. Acquire a short-term rental, have your tenants stay in there on average seven days or less. You only need to get to a hundred hours. I mean, you're going to get to a hundred hours before the end of the year, setting up a short-term rental property. And now you get to benefit from, from some of the same tax laws that these big real estate investors get to benefit mm-hmm. from, which is depreciation. And a lot of folks out there, they'll be like, oh, must be nice. So it's like, well, you play by the same tax rules as well. Yep. Everyone plays by the same tax laws, you know? And so uh, I think Robert Kiyosaki says that they tax the uneducated. Yep. That's you correct. Know? And Ignorance so, tax is the most expensive tax. And people are like, oh, yeah, that's good. And so people are like, oh, why don't you want to pay your taxes? It's like, well, why do you want to give free money to the government when your mom could use a free car? Exactly. You know, so it's a different way of thinking. It is a different way to think about it. Um, but anyways, that said, so that that's huge. Um, another thing here is, you know, depreciation recapture. Mm. I have a lot of folks that reach out on social media and they're like, well, what about depreciation recapture? Yeah. Tell me a little bit about that. What is it and how can you get around it? If you love real estate investing, passive income, and tax benefits, but don't have the time, my company, Summers Capital, is buying boutique hotels right now. We source the deals, we renovate the properties, and we even handle all the day-to-day management, making it truly hands-off for our investors. If you want to learn more to see if we can help you, visit summerscapital.com slash invest to book a call with our team. Again, that's summerscapital.com slash invest. Now back to the show. So first off, if you're going into real estate, you're probably going into real estate because you believe in investing for the long term. You believe that real estate is an asset class that can pay you over time. You get principal pay down. And part of the reason why you're going into real estate is so that you can eventually possibly pass on these assets to the next heirs if you care about generational wealth. Well, one of the things that ends up happening if you're not a true investor and you decide to leverage some of the strategies that true investors leverage, like the cost segregation study, is all of the depreciation that you've accelerated on the tax return, that depreciation comes back to you at ordinary income tax rates if you decide to sell the property. So let's just say that I purchased- It won't be long-term capital gains. It will be ordinary income It'll tax? be ordinary income tax really? rates. Really? Why that is goes- that? it goes all the way up to 37%. And the reason why that is, is because the IRS gave you a tax benefit Mm -hmm. from being able to do the cost segregation study. And you're saying, well, now that I got my tax benefit, I'll just sell the property. If you sell the property without implementing the 1031 exchange strategy, which is what long-term investors will do who want to stay in real estate, then all that money that you just took comes back to you in the form of depreciation. You'll pay ordinary tax rates on that. And then any of the gain that you actually experience will then be subject to long-term capital gains tax rates, depending on how long you held the asset. Gotcha. Um, You know, because a lot of folks, you know, don't necessarily, everyone thinks, oh, you got to do a 1031 exchange. Now, you don't always have to do 1031 exchange because another thing you could do is take those proceeds and buy another property in that same calendar year and do another cost seg study and get a bunch of depreciation and use that depreciation to offset whatever taxes might have been triggered. Yes. Um, so that is another strategy. So you're not pinned to this quick, this quick, tight timeline of a 1031 exchange. Exactly. And it seems like no one talks about this information. I mean, Rich, people could even take money out of their 401ks, pay the 10% penalty, but then not pay the penalty because they bought enough real estate and offsetted the taxes associated with the money they took from their 401k plus the 10% penalty. Mm. It's so powerful. It works in the exact same way. That's so powerful. Um, so let's talk about the 1031 exchange. Yeah. What, what is the 1031 exchange? Yeah, the 1031 exchange is where you decide to sell your property and buy a like-kind property within a 180-day period. The downside to the 1031 exchange is you have to identify the property that you wish to buy within 45 days. So this kind of causes a little stress for the person who's new to this. You have to know what type of property you want to buy. And the property that you want to buy has to be equal or greater in value than the property that you're selling. So let's just say I have a single family home in Texas and it's a half a million dollars and the property appreciated to 600K. Maybe I want to sell the property and I'm going to pay capital gains taxes on that 100K. Well, since I held that property for investment purposes and I don't want to pay capital gains taxes, I could do a 1031 exchange. I can identify another property that's at least worth 600,000 or maybe two properties that equal to 600,000, I sell my first property and then I roll over the gain into that new property or new properties. And I need to make sure that I do this within a 180 day period. I have 180 days to close escrow on the new property. Yeah. Yeah. So 180 days doesn't sound as bad as the, the 45. And so the 45 is really 45 to identify. Yeah. You have 45 days to first identify the property, which is why I always recommend to identify more than one property, because let's just say the first property goes through, you have what's called a failed 1031 exchange. Now you do have to pay capital gains taxes on the sale of the mm. first property. And so it's just three property addresses. Yes, that's, that's correct. You get is. three okay. property addresses gotcha. for a 1031. So you really have 180 days, which is not too bad. Six um, months. Six months. Yeah. I've only done one 1031. 
And with that one, the the day I closed with the down leg, two days later I closed with the the up leg. Oh, there you go. And so I had the up leg under contract um, like 45 days before we closed on the actual sale of yeah. the down leg. Um, and we did a, the, the down leg that we sold was a 32 unit apartment building in Indianapolis. And I had uh, a couple partners on that. And we were all invested into, we were partners of the entity that owned the property. Yeah. And so we did what's uh, called a tenants in common. Or we set, oh, up, tick. we set up a tick. Yeah. So we could all 1031 and go our separate ways. Because typically or traditionally the 1031 exchange is like an all or nothing thing. Right. And so that was kind of one loophole around it. And there you then go. Uh, I was able to 1031 my proceeds into a luxury uh, property out in Scottsdale, which is now like a luxury Airbnb out there. Um, but... For me, I didn't have to sweat the 45 days or the 180 days. It was literally, we closed on the, the up uh, down leg and then closed on the up leg like literally two days later. So that was nice. That is so nice. One thing that people don't understand too about doing a 1031 exchange is when they hear about the 1031, they get all excited about it. Okay, I can avoid capital gains taxes and just stay in real estate. So they'll go to the real estate agent, and start selling their property and then give their real estate agent the next property they want to buy. If their real estate agent isn't a 1031 exchange accommodator and they touch any of the money, it's considered a failed 1031 exchange. Mm. So you act, you have to go to an actual 1031 exchange accommodator and you cannot touch any part of the transaction or it's considered a boot and that's a failed 1031 exchange. Gotcha, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, so what exactly is a reverse 1031 exchange? A reverse 1031 exchange is where you have identified the property uh, first before you've decided to sell the first property. And the IRS will allow for you to still be able to roll over your capital gains taxes even though you haven't sold the first property. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. So this would work well for someone that um, wants to buy a property. They need to use the proceeds of the uh, actually they don't need to use the proceeds of the of the sale. Correct. Right. And they can come up with their own down payment to close. And then how long do they have to sell the other property and actually do the reverse? 10, 30, 180 1? days now. 180 days. Yeah. So wow. they get the six months. So this is a great way for someone to trade up into something larger without having that big time crunch. You could take your time finding the perfect deal and then go back after the fact and sell one of your existing assets, That's right? That's 100% correct. And, and Yeah, go ahead. And same thing happens here where the proceeds, what, what's the caveat, the loophole here? Like the proceeds for the down, uh, I'm sorry, for the sale cannot actually go into the investor's hands. It has to go to the intermediary. The intermediary. Got and it. then the intermediary will transfer the assets and they'll become the basis in the new property. That's correct. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah. Um, Part of I, the reason why sometimes people will do a reverse 1031 exchange is because anytime you're doing a 1031 exchange, it needs to be like kind. So let's just say I closed on my first property in an LLC, uh, or sorry, let's just say I closed on my first property in my primary name, and then I transferred it into an LLC. Well, if I'm getting ready to do a 1031 exchange, I actually have to transfer that title back into my individual name since I closed on the property in my individual name. I didn't close on it in an LLC. Mm. So sometimes people will go forward with buying that, that next property and then they have to retitle that existing property and then sell it and then roll over the proceeds into that new property. Sounds a little bit confusing, but this is part of the reason why the reverse 1031 works for people who are moving quickly. Yeah, that does uh, make a lot of sense. That's interesting. So we worked with uh, Lanco Exchange. I think they're out of Orange County. Nice. Um, they told me they don't do reverses, but um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's a powerful thing to be able to do the exchange. And so what does like kind mean? Because for me, I, I went from a multifamily to a luxury short-term rental. Yeah. And I would have thought that's not like kind, but it yeah. qualifies. So what, what is, what like defines like kind? So as long as you're still going into a residential or a commercial property, you can still 1031, but you can't 1031 into a vehicle, for example, that's mm. com considered a different type of asset to the IRS. What about land? Like let's say multifamily to a piece of land. You cannot 1031 into land okay. either. Yeah, you can uh, do a 1031 exchange from land to land, but you can't do a 1031 exchange from residential to land. Okay, that makes a lot of sense. But yeah. you can go residential to commercial. So like in yes, existing you can. structure, like self-storage, uh, yes, retail, can. mobile home parks, hospitality, that all qualifies. That all qualifies. Okay, yep. that's good to know. Um, so there's a, there's a, there's a loophole out here and I don't have kids. Uh, and so I, I never actually looked into this and I don't know how it works, but I hear a lot of folks talking about it. Um, the placing children on payroll strategy. Yeah. What exactly is that? So this is a, an income shifting strategy where you can hire your children to work inside of your business. Typically 
will set up a separate business called a management company. And this management company will truly be for the family. It'll be for the kids. Maybe the kids are picking up staples in the, in the dad or the mother's office or coming to the investment property, helping the parents list the property online, doing marketing, social media manager. And this is a way for you to incentivize your kids to work with you inside the business and receive a tax deduction. For the year 2023, the IRS will allow for you to deduct $13,850 per child. Wow. So if you have two kids, it's like $27,700 in a tax deduction. That's a pretty big tax savings when you are in the 30% tax bracket. You're saving over five, $6,000 in taxes. Does the entity that you're actually employing these, these kids under need to be a profitable or does it need to be bringing in revenue for it to qualify? So the revenue that you're actually bringing into this new entity is called a management fee. So let's just say that you have your S corporation rich and then you have children. Well, we might set up a separate LLC to be a management company. Your S corp can pay that LLC management fees. Uh, so now seriously. your children get paid out from the management fees that came originally from your S corporation. And maybe you only choose to move over just the amount to pay your kids. Mm -hmm. So 27,700 leaves your S corp's bank account. You record the tax deduction. Then your LLC receives 27,700. But rather than paying taxes over there, moving money from the right hand to the left hand, you hire your children and place them on payroll and pay them each $13,850. Now you just created a second tax deduction inside that management company. If you want to take it a step further, what you can do is set up a, cons a custodial IRA, Roth IRA for your children. And now you can put $6,000 that no one paid taxes on into their Roth IRA and it can grow tax free. I'm not, you know, too crazy at math, but the S&P 500 has somewhere around a 10 to 12% return. So if you start this at the age of five, by the time your child is 60 years old without making any other contributions, they'll have close to a million dollars sitting inside their Roth IRA. Wow, that's a that's a powerful thing. What is the max to contribute to a Roth IRA? Six thousand. Six thousand and then seven thousand if you're over the age of fifty. Okay. And what about the income threshold for that? The income threshold ends, I believe, right around a hundred and twenty thousand. It fluctuates every single year due to inflation. But if you're making over one hundred fifty thousand, you can't contribute to a Roth IRA anymore. Uh, what is the backdoor Roth? I've heard of people kind of making more than the threshold, but yeah. still being able to participate. What exactly is the backdoor Roth? The backdoor Roth is a great strategy for people who don't qualify to put money into a Roth IRA. They can essentially contribute to a traditional IRA and then backdoor into a Roth IRA after the tax year is over. So let's just say you contribute the $6,000 to your traditional IRA, you receive the tax deduction, mm -hmm. and then you convert it into a Roth IRA in the following year. Then you'll pay taxes on that money so it can continue to grow tax-free. Gotcha. Okay, that makes a lot of sense. So I worked as a government employee for the federal government as an air traffic controller for 11 years. Wow. And um, I maxed out my 401k basically the entire time I was there. Yeah. And so when I cashed it out, that was my seed money to do my first couple of deals in the real estate space. And so, you know, I, I built it up over the 11 year career and it grows, but it doesn't grow as fast as like, you know, um, they say it is right. Yeah. Um, it, it does. Okay. It did. Okay. And, and I'm thankful that I did it, but I maxed it out. And I think when I started the max was like, 18,000, maybe it was like 17,000. Yep. And then the government would match like about another 6,000 by the end of the year. And then it was like 18,500. Then it was 19, 19,500. They kept stepping it up. Yep. And, um, you know, all in, I'd be putting about $25,000 with the match every single year. And then it would compound, which is really cool. But when I cashed it out, I had to pay a 10% penalty to the Fed. Yep. I had to pay a 2.5% penalty to the state of California. Yep. And then the rest of it was taxed as ordinary income. Correct. But it was the best thing I ever did because it got me in the real estate game. And then, as you know, with all the depreciation with real estate, um, a lot of that stuff transitioned over and carried over. And now I have a lot of tax advantages because I decided to cash out that 401k. But yep. I guess my question is, um, you know, for, for a high income earner out there today, is it better to put their money into a traditional uh, 401k or, or, or uh, IRA, or is it better to do it into a Roth in your estimation? I think most Americans should focus on building tax-free dollars. They should be putting their money into the Roth and sacrificing and paying the taxes now. And the only reason why I say that is because me and you, Rich, don't know what the tax rates are going to be in 5, 10, 15 years. Mm -hmm. What we do know right now is the taxes are the lowest they've been historically ever. So if I know that the tax rates are historically low right now, why not sacrifice, put money into the Roth account, have that money grow tax-free? Now, maybe I'm somebody that already has a 401k and I've been contributing to a traditional 401k. Well, this is kind of interesting. Maybe you can make the conversion over and start contributing to a Roth, or maybe you're someone that really needs that tax deduction. Well, one of the things that you have at your disposal, if your employer will allow this, is you can actually set up an LLC, roll over your 401k into a solo 401k, 
self-direct it, and now you have access to that funds to be able to invest it how you wish. I have clients that have investment properties sitting inside of their 401k accounts, and they are able to take depreciation inside of their 401k accounts. And that money is going to grow probably at a higher percentage than the S&P 500 just because they're buying the right type of properties. I love that. I would say about 35% of the investors in our fund, we have a boutique hotel fund, about 35% of them invest through a self-directed IRA. Yeah. And a lot of these folks out there, you know, they have old IRAs from, you know, old employers sitting yep. around collecting dust. And a lot of these folks, they haven't logged in in three, four, five years. They don't even know how much is in there. Um, some of these investors, they didn't even know the name of the custodian because it's been that long, right? Yeah. And so uh, a lot of those folks are like, yeah, like I didn't even, I forgot I even had it. I didn't realize I could invest into boutique hotels using my my, my IRA money. Yep. And they would just roll it over to some of the custodians that we use. And it's a pretty smooth, streamlined process. But um, what exactly is a solo? Because I'm very familiar with the the self-directed IRA, but what is a solo 401k? Hey guys, real quick, the only way the show grows, the only way we continue to bring on bigger and better guests is if you guys rate, review, and share the show. So if you could take two seconds or the click of the thumb to review on Apple or Spotify, it will mean the world to me. But more importantly, we'll be able to reach more entrepreneurs and more real estate investors and help them build wealth through this podcast. Now back to the show. Yeah, solo 401k is for someone who is the sole owner of a business. So if you have any employees, you do not qualify for a solo 401k. But what this will allow for you to do is it allow for you to put 22,500, but you can also match it as an employer, making your entire contributions up to $66,000 in the year of 2023. That's a big tax deduction. But one of the benefits to self-directing a solo 401k is once you choose to self-direct it, you're in control of where those funds get invested. If you wanna put all 66,000 in an Apple stock, be my guest. You wanna put it into crypto? There's accounts mm. out there and custodians that will do that. But what if you want to invest in real estate? Now you can use that self-directed solo 401k to purchase an investment property, a short-term rental or a single family home or a multifamily, or you can even put it into a syndication. Yeah, no, that makes a lot of sense. And so the proceeds or the returns from, let's just say the cash flow from the real estate investment yes. will go back into the solo 401k. Correct. But because it's solo, you're going to get a lot more control than if it was with a custodian um, that's doing the self-directed, correct? That's correct. When you're self-directing, you're saying, I want to take ownership of those funds and how they're being invested mm -hmm. versus just saying, I want a third-party administrator to determine what those assets are being invested in. Maybe your TPA is Vanguard or TD Ameritrade or you have somebody in Northwestern, whatever it might be, they're going to choose what assets that your money is going into or what investments your money is going into. When you choose to self-direct it, you're saying, I want to take full ownership of where those assets are being invested. Mm -hmm. And for many taxpayers who want to get into real estate, this could be that bridge for them to be able to get in by using their retirement dollars. Yeah. Now, these custodians out there that that facilitate the self-directed IRA, yeah. um, some of them have limits in, in terms of like what you can invest in and what options you have. Yes. And um, I, I believe a lot of them won't allow you to invest into your own real estate projects. But you're saying with the solo 401k, you as long as you have your own business uh, entity that you're 100% owner, you can invest into your own projects as well? Yes, but because you're not the one that's investing, your 401k is the one that's investing. Mm, because so it's a loophole. It's a loophole. It's not you. Gotcha. So it's considered a separate person almost. The 401k has its own account. And you can have an LLC associated to that account. All the money gets deposited into that 401k and all the bills have to get paid by that 401k. The mortgage, uh, the management fees, and all the deductions stay inside of that 401k as well. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, now, if you're 1099 um, and you want to set up an IRA or 401k, I believe there's a, a threshold to where you can go past that that cap of like 18,000. or What's the cap today? Is it like probably 22,500? 22, 22,500 now. Okay. Yeah. Inflation, right? Uh, so is, if you're a 1099 and let's say you're a business owner, um, is there, there's a way to invest a lot more than that, correct? Yeah. What can, is that? You could set up a SEP or you can set up a defined benefit plan or a solo 401k, but the SEP will allow for you to put 66,000, just like the solo 401k per year. How it works is, is you can contribute as an employee, 22,500 and the other 44,000 and some change would be contributed on the employer side. Mm. But when you're on the SEP, you have to make sure that you're taking enough salary to be able to contribute the maximum amount of 66,000 because the IRS will limit you to 25% of whatever your wages are. So if you want to max out the SEP, you have to earn at least $264,000 a year in a salary from your own company to be able to max out a SEP. 
And this is why I typically recommend the solo 401k, because if you're the solo owner, you can choose to do the 22,500 and match the other side without the uh, discrepancy or without the scrutiny of having to get your salary up to such a high limit. I love that. So with the 401k, the traditional, uh, you can borrow against it. So I believe when I was doing it, you could borrow up to $50,000 or half of your account balance, whichever is the lower of the two numbers, I believe. Now with a solo 401k, can you borrow against it? And if so, is there a threshold? Yeah, it's the same as the traditional 401k and you can borrow against it to purchase a primary residence or for health related reasons or for education. Oh, for education. Yeah. Okay. So what I did was a, cause I was still working. And so I just, I filed a financial hardship. Oh, and that's wow. how I got the money out. Yep. And they said, initially they said, Hey, you can, you can take it all out except for the government match money. Correct. And then 2020 happened with COVID and they said, they had this period. They said, you can take out whatever. Yeah. And so I was like, I went in there real quick and I took it all out. And then, um, and then at the, towards the end of 2020, they're like, all right, hey, like everyone's coming back to work. And I said, Hey, I'm out of here. And that's when I punched out. Yep. But uh, I got lucky because I was able to get it all out because had COVID not happened, I believe that match money would have had to stay in there till I was like age 62 or something like that. Yeah, 59 and a half. You're absolutely right. Yeah, 59 right. and a half. So I got, I got very lucky. Yeah, that's awesome. <laughs> you timed that a, out correctly. That was a good chunk too because it, it all compounds, you know, after 11 years. So I'm, it, I'm happy that a lot of people, you know, decided to take actionable steps to grow during COVID versus, you know, letting their foot up off the gas and just sheltering in and trying to stock up toilet paper entrepreneurs yeah. like you were you know pushing your ideas forward and you were betting on yourself and you're investing while other people were timid and you know we're probably just trying to you know make it to the next day yeah. i was one of those people too just like yourself that decided to go hard during covid while other people were kind of letting their foot up off the gas well it was a it was an interesting time because everyone was at home uh, a lot of people were, were consuming a lot of media whether it was yeah. social media on their phones or they're consuming a lot of tv um, and so like, like yourself, I mean, what I did was we were, we were working on the air traffic thing and I was doing six day work weeks, working weekends, nights, holidays. Um, I really, I didn't have a life outside of work, yeah. but luckily we had a lot of breaks. Now during COVID, mm -hmm. it was great cause we went on these, like these, these shifts because everyone was, no one was flying anymore Yeah. for like literally most of 2020, like a lot of the air travel stopped. Right. And so they were like, Hey, we don't need everyone here. So we went on these, like they call them skeleton crews five days on 10 days off. And I thought, holy shit, this is like a dream come true. And yeah. So I was building the real estate stuff at the time and I was kind of like planning my escape plan, right? Yeah. And my exit strategy. And so <laughs> I literally just took all that time at home to just like really pour into the real estate business. And so at the end of 2020, when they said, hey, you guys are all coming back to normal work weeks, <laughs> I was like, I'm out of here. <laughs> you already had a real estate business set up. Yeah. That's because yeah. you took action, man. Yeah. Yeah. And so um, 2020, it, it really happened at the right time. And I thought, you know, if I can grow it and uh, figure it out now when everything's shut down and we're in a quote unquote recession. I was like, um, you know, I'll be able to figure it out post. And so I punched out of there and dude, it's about to be three years, which is crazy. That's this unreal. Congrats. Next month will be three years. I'm glad that you created escape plan. It's so funny that COVID taught everyone, dude, you should have an escape plan. Your employer could literally shut down their doors right now. If they yeah. want to, they could literally lay everybody off. Mm -hmm. Like there was no incentive to keep employees until the employee retention tax credit came out. And no one knew what that was, right? So mm -hmm. I personally think that every single person that's working for an employer should always have an escape plan. No matter how successful you are, you're still working for another person. And that person may not have your retirement interest all the way figured out. Mm -hmm. That's so powerful. Uh, so for the folks out there that are, you know, high income earners, let's say they're making 10 million plus. Yeah. What's a couple of good tax strategies for those folks? You're making 10 million plus, you're probably self-employed, which means we need to take some money off of the tax return. One of the strategies that I like to do this with is utilizing what's called an off-year C corporation. So many of my taxpayers are operating inside of S corporations. S corporations file taxes March 15th, and then you pay the taxes April 15th when you file your individual tax return. Well, I could set up a C corporation for someone right at the end of the year that operates as a management company with a different fiscal year end. What that means is it does not file tax returns in the same year as your S corporation. So let's just say that you write a check from that 10 million, maybe 30%, 3 million over to your C corporation, well, I can set up your C corporation to have a fiscal year end September 15th, okay. four months and 15 days after it ends its year is when it files its tax return. So that C corporation wouldn't file tax returns until January of 2025. So I'm positioning you to be able to shift income over to a corporation, receive a tax deduction today and buying you more time to be able to spend down that money as opposed to just writing a check to Uncle Sam. And this is a way I, in which I help a lot of high net worth individuals with other philanthropy strategies as well. Well, 
that's a that's a powerful thing. Um, talk about the tax benefits of owning a jet. Oh, okay. So there's some taxpayers out there that have purchased a jet, and I'm working with a few that are purchasing jets and uh, yachts right now. The reason why that they're purchasing these vehicles is because the IRS will allow for you to claim bonus depreciation on an aircraft carrier that's used for business purposes. Although bonus depreciation right now in 2023 is at 80% for a jet that doesn't start until next year. Mm. So if you decide to buy a jet this year, you can take 100% bonus depreciation on a jet. Obviously it's over 6,000 pounds, but it has to be in business use hundred percent. So you can't take any personal flights. But if you're able to buy this before the end of the year, place it in business use, you can write off 100% of the purchase price of the jet, whether you financed it or not. Yeah, I love that. Um, I've had some guests on, uh, Chris Cohn, Grant Cardone, Dan Martell was recently on, and these guys all have private jets, but they're like, yeah, I mean, I think Grant played, said he paid cash, but like Chris, uh, I didn't ask Dan, but Chris is like, yeah, I put like basically a 30% down on this jet, and I was able to depreciate all this extra money. Yeah. And uh, he's like, yeah, it's basically a free jet. Yeah. You know, and so that's a powerful thing. And you could charter it out in the meantime. So you're yeah. making up for the cost because obviously there's an expense to operating a jet and having, you know, gas accrue. Mm -hmm. um, but most of these entrepreneurs will charter it out, making it into a business, kind of like having a Turo. Once you've written off the car, maybe in your tax returns, maybe you don't need that car as much anymore. Maybe you decide to run a Turo business and rent out the car. Mm -hmm. Now it still has utility. Yeah, no, that's a powerful thing. I didn't realize you could do it with the yacht. Oh, absolutely. So it's the same exact way, but you have to use it for business and you could even hire a captain and, and charter it out when you're not using it. Without a doubt, you can do that. We have a lot of clients that moved from California to Miami and mm -hmm. you know, Miami is a yacht city. So yeah. if you decide to host masterminds out on the water and you decide to bring your business clients out on the water, you can have a vehicle that's for business. So I have taxpayers who are purchasing yachts before the end of the year and they're able to claim 80% bonus depreciation with code section 179 and code section 168K. I got to connect you to uh, one of my good friends. Uh, shout out to Dave Champagne. So Dave, he owns um, the Champagne Yacht here in San Diego. Very popular yacht charter service. And uh, he crushes it. And we actually charter his yacht for our real estate meetups, the ones that we do on the water. We do them like May through September when the weather's warm. Yeah. Um, and then he's got another boat that he bought kind of for personal use. It's like a 75-foot uh, Sea Ray. Really nice. Uh, it's called Caviar. He invites me on it every now and then. A uh, super gorgeous yacht. But um, I know he was hitting me up recently for some good uh, tax CPA, like accounting, like referrals, um, recommendations. I'll have to connect you because I know he's he's probably got a lot of like levers he can pull. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, with the money that he's pulling in from the yachts uh, to where, you know, if he doesn't have the right CPA, he's probably leaving a lot of money on the table. Oh, without a doubt. And most people only have maybe just a CPA. They don't have a tax strategist as well, right? Mm -hmm. And when you get to that point, like you said earlier, you know, I my, had my CPA. She's been doing this for 20 years. She didn't know about the short-term rental strategy. And that's because sometimes CPAs are so focused on just doing public accounting. Every single day, they're waking up and they're filing tax returns and they're constantly in front of just tax software that's filing tax returns. Whereas a tax professional is just studying tax code. Mm -hmm. So when it comes to all these new laws, like the short-term rental strategy that no one knew about, I was one of the first people that knew about that because I'm just spending time studying laws all day while most CPAs are just spending time filing tax returns all day. Mm -hmm. So I'm positioned to be out in front of the law and can educate more people about it. Whereas a CPA might find out about it later when it comes around to filing the tax return. Yeah. So I got a question. So yeah, I have a, uh, I'm an exotic car club and my car doesn't meet the the weight threshold or whatever of the um what's what's that tax strategy with the SUVs and all that yeah what's so that your gross vehicle weight ratio has to be over 6000 pounds okay so my car is like a little two door coupe but I'm in this exotic car club um can I write off any portion of that car because I'm using it for business purposes. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, the IRS will still allow for you to write off a vehicle that doesn't weigh over 6,000 pounds on your tax returns. And the IRS depreciates cars over the course of five years. So let's just say the car was, you know, $50,000. You'd be able to write off $10,000 every single year up to five years. But you can also claim what's called double declining method, which is another accelerated depreciation method that allow for you to kind of double your first year write off in the first year that you place it in business use. So if you do have an exotic car, you would still be able to write it off. You might get more than ten or fifteen thousand dollars in a write off, depending on what type of vehicle it is. OK, got it. So uh, what would what would be like what percentage do you think I could write off of that vehicle? Let's just say 
50 percent of the time I'm driving it, I'm driving it with this group for business and networking opportunities and meetings. Yes. So if the car is listed 50 percent personal use, 50 percent business use, then you get to write off 50 percent of the car's value over the course of five years. So maybe it's a hundred thousand dollar car. Well, now you get 50,000 and then you divide that 50,000 over five years. And that's your depreciation deduction every single year as you have that car in your business. Would title have to be held under a business entity of mine or could it be another personal name? This is a good question and one that I really like answering. If you own a car and you have a business, you can buy the car in your individual name and still be able to write it off underneath your business. What we do as tax professionals is we allocate the vehicle over to your LLC or over to your S corporation, mm -hmm. even though the loan's in your individual name. The IRS does not care. This is one of the weird things that the IRS actually does not care about. You can choose to take a vehicle deduction on your business, even though you bought it in your individual name. That's good to know. And so remind me the name of the uh, the one for the SUVs. Yeah, that's called that Code one? Section 179 plus Code Section 168K. Okay, what exactly is Code Section 179? Code Section 179 allows for you to write off a vehicle that weighs over 6,000 pounds or a piece of equipment that has useful life of less than 20 years all in one year. And code section 168K allows for you to claim the bonus depreciation on that vehicle. So that means that you get to actually take the full write off in that year. 179 just says that you have qualifying equipment that qualifies. Code section 168K says you have a vehicle that you wish to take bonus depreciation on, and we're gonna allow for you to write off all that depreciation in one year. And do you, can you also lease the car or is it, do you have to buy it or finance it? So if you're taking depreciation, you have to own the car. Okay. If you lease the car to a corporation, then you might be able to take personal depreciation on it, but that's for another time. So if you're somebody that's wondering if you have a leased car, you can write off your leased car payments, your car insurance, the car, uh, the tires, your car wash, but you won't be able to claim depreciation. Gotcha. So hypothetically, you buy a hundred thousand dollar SUV, put zero down, you finance it. Yeah. You would qualify for how much of depreciation in, in year one? 100% bonus depreciation. Oh, well, actually it's at 80% for the year of 2023. So if you bought a $100,000 car and it's a 100% business use car, then you'd be able to write off 80,000 in year one on your tax returns, even wow. if you do it at the end of the year. Even if you put zero down and financed 100% of it. Yes, and now that you're leveraging OPM, but you're also stimulating the economy too, right? Mm -hmm. You're buying a vehicle, there's gonna be a payment due, you're gonna pay sales tax on that. Um, but essentially you're acquiring a vehicle for your business and same with real estate. If you decide to sell that car next year, you're going to have depreciation recapture. All of that depreciation you took on your tax returns comes back to you in the form of ordinary income. What are a few popular car examples that qualify for this? Yeah. I like helping people write off G wagons. You know, most people look at the G wagon as a luxury SUV. So if you buy a G wagon, typically those are around 150,000 starting out unless you're going the G63. So I'll place a G63 inside of an S corporation claim 179 plus 168 K right off the entire purchase price. Well, 80% for this year, 2023. And now we're off to the races, saving money in taxes. Many, ta many entrepreneurs are doing marketing with these G wagons or with these Lamborghini Urises or uh, even with a Rolls Royce Cullinan. Mm. So if you can buy- Blake Rocha has a, uh, the Rolls, right? Yep, Rocha has the yep. Rolls. He gave me a tour when he was here for the podcast. Oh, it's a nice car, man. It is a nice car. Yeah. So that one qualifies as well. Yeah, yeah. I love that. Yep, absolutely. We're thinking about upgrading to that this year, so we'll see if that happens. My okay. wife has the G-Wagon, I have the Urus. So we've already written off two 6,000 pound cars. I don't think we need another one right now. <laughs> <laughs> are there any like sedans, there are smaller cars that are not SUVs that actually just happen to be heavy that qualify? Yeah, the Rolls Royce Ghost qualifies okay. for code section 179. The Dawn also weighs over 6,000 pounds, qualifies for 179. The Bentley uh, Flying Spur qualifies for 179. Those are some, some sedans that I've written off. Even the AMG GT3 uh, Mercedes qualifies for over 6,000 pounds. Wow. So you can find a sedan that weighs over 6,000 pounds that you can write off. I wonder if that's strategic by these manufacturers, like, hey, we're gonna price the, ta the, the tag really expensive, but we're gonna make it so there's huge tax advantages. Oh, 150%. <laughs> I have clients that literally told me, Carlton, I walked into Mercedes and I just said, show me the vehicles that weigh over 6,000 pounds. And they were like, oh yeah, we, we get clients that ask this all the time. Matter of fact, <laughs> here's our brochure that has all the vehicles that gross vehicle weight ratio are over 6,000 yeah. pounds. Dealerships are getting smart. So they're appealing to their customers and knowing that some of their customers are entrepreneurs. How can we make it as easy as possible? Let's calculate how much the depreciation write-off is gonna be for them on the lot. So some, yeah. some dealers are actually doing that. Rolls Rice and Bentley are like, man, this is like the number one question from all of our clients. Oh, let's, without let's a doubt. Let's down these cars. Yeah, you know Rolls Royce has sold more Rolls Royces just because they created the Cullinan. That's so good. Yeah. Well, dude, Carlton, it's been a pleasure, man. How can folks uh, get in touch with you? 
Yeah, absolutely. I'm Carlton Dennis on all social media platforms. You can subscribe to us on Instagram, YouTube, and send us a DM. We'd love to connect and see how we can help you with taxes. Dude, and uh, we're going to have to connect up in Newport Beach, man, next time I'm up in the area. Come down and get some Nobu. There's no Nobus yeah. out here, I don't think, man. Yeah, you got to come drive the, down. Where's the Nobu up that way? Where, where's uh, it located? It's in Newport Beach on the marina, so right outside of Lido Village. Peninsula? You know where that is? Yeah, Peninsula. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I'm familiar. Um, cool. Next time I'm up there, I'll definitely hit you up, and uh, let's connect, dude. Let's do it, man. He's Carlton Dennis. I'm Rich Summers. Listeners, thanks for tuning in. We'll see you in the next one. Peace. Thank you.